Okay, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at flip-flops and latches. Um, there's only six units you need to know uh, when it comes to latches and flip-flops. And I'll go through uh, each one of them. Um, but before I do, I just want to explicitly say what the difference is between all the work that we've done up to now and this. And the big difference is all the work we've done up to now is called combinational logic. And that means that the output is only dependent on the inputs. When you start to work with things like flip-flops and latches, suddenly you have something that we call sequential logic. So in this case, the output is not dependent only on the inputs anymore. Now your output depends on what the previous output is, as well as the inputs. So if you want to think of it that way, it's almost as if we're saying, Previously, my output was just a function of the input. If it was an AND gate, then you would have said, OK, this thing performs an AND function, and that's it. But what we have now is something called sequential circuit. And what that sequentiality means is that we're taking this as one of the inputs. Our output becomes one of the inputs. So suddenly, we have something that says, not only do I consider the inputs, when I make a judgment of what the output should be, but I also consider what the current state of my output is. And that is essentially adding memory to the circuit. So now our, um, our electronics can remember what its current state is when it evaluates other inputs as well. And that's what we call sequential logic. So let's quickly go through the ones that we have. Um, the first one you need to know is just the basic SR latch. And what this basic SR latch does is, um, it, it says uh, it has two inputs, a set and a reset, S or R, a or R, and the output here just looks at whether it's set or reset is high. If set is high, Q will be 1. If reset is high, Q will be low. This not Q is the inverse of Q. And then here is where the memory is added. If S is low and reset is low, so if it's not being set and it's not being reset, then Q maintains its previous value. That's what's indicated here. If set is 1, Q is 1. If reset is 1, Q is 0. However, if they're both 0, this thing just remembers its value and keeps at it. The second one is called a gated SR latch. And the way that this works is, it has a small little line there called clock in this example, which really is performing the function of an enable line. It enables the input. And the way that this thing works is, if that clock input is low, then the inputs are disabled, which essentially means this thing just remembers its value Q. However, if clock is equal to 1, then the inputs are disabled, and this essentially turns into a basic SR latch again. So that's the big difference there. You have this called a gated SR latch because there's this gate that either allows the inputs in or it keeps them out. Very similar to the function your gated, your home, uh, performs. Then we have the third one here called a gated D latch. And in this case, we don't have the S and R anymore. Now we just have one input, D. And how this thing works is, if clock is 0, Q just remembers its value. If clock is equal to 1, then Q will take the value of D. And I want to be very clear about this. How this works is, while clock is equal to 1, Q will reflect D. So whatever happens on clock will happen on Q if clock, uh, sorry, what happen, whatever happens on D will happen on Q as long as clock is 1. When clock is 0, D is ignored. Now what you can see is this dependence, this dependence on clock is what we call a level dependence. If clock is equal to 1, then Q takes D. It's level sensitive. And that's what we're trying to communicate there. The next batch is edge sensitive. So it's not working with a, a level anymore. We're adding to it now. So we're working towards a much more involved little chip here. 
The next one I want to introduce, want to introduce is a D flip-flop. The D flip-flop can either be positive or negative edge triggered. Note the word edge triggered there, and I'll explain what that means now. How this thing works is, it says, whenever I have an edge on clock, the value of D will be sampled. Hear that word? Sampled. In Afrikaans, gemonster. The value of D will be sampled and put onto Q and kept there until I have another clock edge. Now, before you ask what a clock edge is, a clock edge means this has happened. That is called a rising edge. So, clock has gone from 0 to 1 and at that instant, D was sampled and put onto Q and then Q keeps that value until we have another clock edge. Then D will be sampled again and put onto Q. This is called a positive edge or a rising edge. And that flip-flop that we have there is triggered on a rising edge. Note the little triangle there. That little triangle says I'm triggering on an edge. Just going to go back one slide to show you. If it's level sensitive, there's no triangle there, meaning it's a latch. A latch is level, level dependent, so while clock is 1, Q will do whatever D does. For the flip-flop, which is edge sensitive, it says when I have a clock edge, a positive edge, D will be sampled and put onto Q, and then Q will ignore D until I have another edge event there. So this one is a continuous process. While clock is 1, it's continually taking D and putting it onto Q. This one here is an event trigger that says, now, take D and put it on Q. It's almost like we're saying, copy it and paste it when I have that edge. The falling edge equivalent, so if you're looking for a falling edge, you just put a bubble there. This here is triggering on a negative edge. So that'll say, if I have a negative edge, then sample D, Sample just means take its value and put it onto Q and keep it there until I have another falling edge. And then again, we sample D and take Q. Just want to show you something on the graph quickly. So if you have this, and let's say D was equal to 1 on a rising edge, let's say we're working with this flip-flop here, the rising edge triggered one, the positive, tri positive edge triggered one. This will say at this point, sample D and then put it onto Q. So Q will become 1 there. And let's just fix this quickly. So let's say D did this. D was 1 initially, and then it went to 0 before this clock edge here. At this clock edge, the flip-flop will say sample D, and you can see at this point it's equal to a 0, so it'll make Q 0. So Q will do this. It'll st we don't know what its value is. We don't know what its value is until we have this rising edge. When we have this rising edge, its value is 1. Then, at this point, just after it's sampled this 0, it'll turn it into 0. And there we go. Just to be clear about what happened here, we have clock, we have D and Q. And, in fact, I should just redo that, shouldn't I? Um, this is clock. Clock does this. That's my clock, and let's say D does the following. So D is 1, and then it changes to 0, and let's say it changes to 1 again. Let's say it keeps 1, and then it turns to 0 just before that clock edge there. So what will happen at Q is, if it's a positive edge triggered flip-flop, so we have a flip-flop that does this, D, Q, and clock. Then Q will say, whenever there's a rising edge, rising edge, um, I'm going to sample D. So initially, until I have my first rising edge, I have no idea what the value of Q is. Only when I have that rising edge, then I know, ah, Q will take the value of D, which is 1 at that edge, and put it onto Q then this will keep its value until I have another clock edge. So when I have another clock edge, I know I will sample D, 
and then d is low so the value of q becomes low as well here i have another clock edge so the value of q will be maintained until that point at this clock edge this rising clock edge see the falling edge is completely ignored at the rising clock edge it samples d yet again and it's high so it makes q high it keeps that value until i have the next rising edge at the next rising edge it samples d it sees uh, d must be one so it just keeps it one and then at that rising edge there samples d again and sees it much below so there you go so that's q not q will just reflect the inverse of q this is very important if you if you get this you get flip-flops so negative edge one will not trigger on the positive edges it will trigger here and here and here and here uh, sorry there we go here so it'll sample at those points it'll sample then we also have the D flip flop with preset and clear and this is what is indicated here and all that this says is I have an overriding preset and an overriding clear which will set and clear Q note that they're negative logic so if preset is zero it'll set Q to one if clear is zero so it's active it'll make Q zero right so that's the overriding functions and they are asynchronous meaning they don't wait for the clock, they just happen. And then if they're both one, so if they're not being uh, driven, or if they're not active, in that case, we're working with a queue that is synchronous. In this case, we wait for a clock edge before anything happens. So I just want to say that again, because that's a new term now, synchronous and asynchronous. If something is synchronous, it waits for the clock, if something is asynchronous, it does not wait for the clock. It just happens asynchronously. Synchronous means with the clock. So preset and clear will just make Q1 or 0. If they're both not active, so if they're both equal to 1, then clock will determine when D is sampled and put onto Q. So while preset and clear are both 1, then this flip-flop here will behave exactly the same as that there. What I'll do is, I'll stop this presentation now, and I'll explain how each one of these worked internally in a separate presentation.